All right, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome on into Katka's webinar today. And I just want to welcome everyone. My name is Hector Araujo. I am the manager of youth leadership here for Katka. And today's webinar is a collaboration between Katka's Geographic Health Equity Alliance and Katka's Youth Leadership Department. It's a two part webinar series. So please make sure to check your inboxes for the announcement of part number two that's going to be following this. We will also be adapting parts one and two of this webinar series into Spanish and in collaboration with Nuestras Voces National Network. So we look forward to the Spanish language webinars beginning in February. So keep your eyes out for those. Um, team, we do have a packed agenda today, but if throughout the training, uh, you do have questions that come up, uh, please feel free to include them in the chat box. There will be a handful of us doing our best to answer any and all of those questions throughout the training. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, the reason why you're here today, it is my pleasure to introduce today's trainers, Rebecca Jin, one of our lead trainers, and Mr. Nigel Rangham, both respectively from the state of Oregon and Illinois. Trainers, the show is yours. Thank you, Hector. Um, well, my name is Nigel, and uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here with 506 of my closest friends, it looks like, so far today. Um, we've been, this is a long time in the making, we've been working on this um, combination of the technical and the process and the theoretical to really get people to, to see the big picture of getting ready to engage youth in policy change, uh, specifically with tobacco, but also with other substances. And uh, this is the getting started one. So I'm glad to be with you and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Rebecca, who I'm delighted always to train with. Hello everyone. Thank you, Hector and Nigel. Yes, my name is Rebecca. I am from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I am a CADCA youth trainer and I'm just super excited to get to spend some time with you today. Like Nigel put beautifully, we have a lot of really cool policy related and education related things to cover and I am so excited to get into it. Right on. So uh, as Hector put it, we have a uh, quite a packed agenda. I look at it more as an exciting path that we're going to be walking together. We're going to take us through um, several key components of what it means uh, to engage youth, how to engage youth, and then where from here. So we're going to start with walking through some misconceptions or myths, if you will, and truths, because um, sometimes our society doesn't fully comprehend youth the way that our society may think that it does. And so we'll walk through some of those. We're also going to walk through a little bit of history about the second half of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century in where public health has come in terms of educating slash involving slash engaging young people. Once we've got that, we're going to talk about the steps to prepare kind of the, so you wanna form a youth group section of our training together, preparing for youth engagement, how we assess our capacities to do that. We'll talk about the differing, equally important, but very different roles of young people and of adults in a collaborative project like this. Then we'll do some final thoughts, some uh, green lights and red lights, some do's and don'ts. So without further ado, that's our path. It's a long one, we can walk it together. We're, we're all, um, 506 of us on this path. So just to begin with kind of an overarching philosophical grounding of where we are today and why we're doing this. There are 50 plus years of youth engagement that especially tobacco control has done in this country. If there's one discipline that's really written the book, quite literally, because we'll talk about what the book is, in terms of tobacco um, control, in terms of engaging youth, excuse me, it is tobacco. Tobacco has engaged young people since the 1970s in active roles in public health promotion, in policies, strategy. So we're going to be looking at that 50 years of youth engagement, because that is, as we said, who wrote the book on it. There is a CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Youth Engagement in Tobacco Prevention and Control Handbook. This handbook, this manual that we see the cover of which illustrated for you here, it's a research-based document. It's from HHS and then the CDC. It's really the most effective toolkit for our work. Much of what we'll be talking about with you today and in part two, and as we continue this, maybe in smaller tactical groups as the year unfolds, is based on 
the best practices that this booklet, this manual has delineated. It's based on that, tempered with, colored in with the experience of terrific youth leaders like my friend Rebecca and all the people that have worked for CADCA. So this is really our, our grounding North Star is this 50 years of youth engagement that the CDC has delineated. We have some grounding principles. And if you think of grounding, we think of a grounding wire, which takes the potentially volatile current and grounds it into one place so that it doesn't dissipate and, and goes where it needs to go and stays safe. Our grounding principles for this whole effort, the first and foremost is health equity. We are about increasing access to, increasing access to the benefits of health promotion, public health for all groups. It's no surprise and it's no shocker to say that in our culture, there have been traditionally groups who've been left out in the cold when it comes to public health, when it comes to prevention, when it comes to equitable practices and retail availability of tobacco, alcohol, and other substances. One of our grounding principles is to open those doors, take away those barriers and increase equity. One of the ways we do that is through authentic and meaningful youth engagement. Authentic and meaningful, not tokenistic, not adultistic, not superficial, but real and authentic. So we grow our youth leaders, not just through inspiration, not just through um, process and working together. Those are terrific, but we add to that actual skill building. In order to change policy, in order to influence the way our culture dispenses these dangerous chemicals that we're talking about, we've got to change the way business is done, and that's policy. So we grow youth leaders by teaching specific skills in policy development. That leads us to that last point there, which is the so-called upstream strategies. Instead of just focusing, as youth involvement has done in the past, which we'll see in a moment, instead of just focusing on keeping the youth from doing the harmful behavior, take the cigarettes out of their hand, punish them when they're doing this. We go upstream and we talk about how do these products not end up in their hands in the first place? How do these products not end up looking enticing to them in the first place? How do these products not get priced and promoted in a way that makes them appealing in the first place. That's upstream, so we're actually preventing a lot of that downstream damage. I'm sure all 500 plus of us are on that page already, but we just wanna put it out there as the grounding principle for our overarching time together. So let's talk about what we think we know versus what we do know. Rebecca is going to be leading us through some of these, so I'm going to turn the uh, the magic um, stand here of stage to Rebecca, and I'll I'll click along and advance the slide. So, Rebecca, what are we going to be talking about with misconceptions and truths? Yes, thank you, Nigel. So, as a society, we might have come to this like consensus that we have this great understanding of young people, what young people like, what young people like to do. But we'll actually find that a lot of this information that we see as truth is really false. Um, so we're gonna go into kind of these common misconceptions, what a misconception is, and then the truths that are actually behind these misconceptions. So just to start off, what exactly is a misconception, you might be wondering. Well, a misconception is a common belief or opinion that is incorrect because it is based on the, um, some sort of faulty thinking or understanding that is false. Um, so in this sense, any kind of opinion that um, a society has come to or that is super popularized or emphasized by a society that is false is known what, as a misconception. As you can see here to the left of this image of an ostrich in the with its head in the sand. A common misconception here is that when ostriches feel frightened or scared, they stick their heads in the sand. But this is false information. This is true, this isn't true. Ostriches do not do this, but because our society propels the idea that they do, we think that it is truth when it isn't. I think I might add too, the misconceptions can be um, kind of silly, like the ostrich in the sand one. They can also be quite harmful. Um, I think it would be doing all of us a disservice if we didn't acknowledge that some widely held misconceptions are 
really risking some of our societal um, unity these days. So misconceptions are downright dangerous sometimes. Let's look at a couple of them and let's uh, hear from you, Rebecca. Yes, so before we get into all these misconceptions, especially relating to misconceptions about youth, we actually wanna hear from you all. So we have a poll question for you all. Um, so the question is, which of the following have you most frequently been told by others? And some of these we will actually be getting um, into and taking a deeper look into. The first option being ostriches bury their heads in the ground when frightened. Um, we had just covered that. You should never wake a sleepwalker. This one is a super common one, along with you should not go swimming within 30 minutes of eating. Coffee stunts your growth is our fourth. And our final is Twinkies will stay fresh for decades. So we'll just give you a couple minutes, um, maybe a minute or so, just to take a look at these and we will share the results in um, about a minute or so. Okay, let's see what folks say. So go ahead and start voting. I imagine we're all looking at it there on the screen, is that correct? Yes, everyone should be able to see um, the poll. And right now we are, are almost at 80%, so oh, I will end nice. the poll very soon, yes. Wow, it runs so fast, awesome. Oh, wow, all right. So looks like our most common with misconception that we've heard of is you should not go swimming within 30 minutes. Funny enough, my mom used to tell me this a lot when I was younger. Um, ostriches bury their heads in the ground when frightened is has to be our minority here, but to the six friends that said that, I see you, I see you out there. Um, okay, and then you should never wake a sleepwalker, coffee sends your growth, around tide, 15, 11%, around the same. And Twinkies will stay fresh for decades, 8%, okay. I just recently learned that that one is false. So very interesting results. Thank you all for sharing. Yeah, thank you. So let's take a look at moving forward. We've seen the examples, of Rebecca. Yes, so these were some examples we included in the poll that you should never ever wake a sleepwalker and you should also never go swimming within 30 minutes of eating. However, the truth behind these is that you should, in fact, it's probably more safe to wake a sleepwalker so that they don't injure themselves. They might be a little confused at first as to why they are in their kitchen when they went to sleep in their bedroom, but you can um, prevent them from hurting themselves or injuring themselves if you are to wake them up. And then you should never ever go swimming within 30 minutes of eating is false because you can actually harm yourself if you were trying to overly exert yourself um, on an empty stomach. So it is rather more important to maybe grab a quick protein shake or a granola bar before swimming so that you're not overly exerting yourself or hurting yourself. But we have been conditioned to believe that these types of things are correct. Um, no problem, Nigel. We've been conditioned to believe these kinds of things are, are true and are correct just because of how society propels them. And so now we're just gonna move forward and take a look at how this relates um, to misconceptions with youth. What I'm really commonly here that we're gonna start off with is youth have really short attention spans. The reasoning behind this is because many adults expect young people to pay less attention to things that are not as relevant or interesting and um, rather pay attention to things that as most adults like to say are more hip. But the truth behind this is that most young people, if not all, we're, we're just people, will focus on anything that's exciting, interesting, relevant, or fascinating. I know if I see something that I'm not familiar with, but I'm intrigued by, I'll be the first to raise my hand, just like anyone else. And continuing on to our next misconception about youth, we have youth only care about themselves. The reason behind this is because most adults believe that entering into adulthood or being in, um, being in a stage of adulthood has more responsibility um, than you are when you are younger. But the truth behind this is that many youth, if not most youth nowadays, um, the rates of youth volunteering are higher than they were nearly three decades ago. So this just goes to show you that youth really do care about others. They care about helping their communities and they care about helping and benefiting other people beyond themselves. And I can personally attest to this at my high school. I think the rates of um, 
community service and youth engaging in volunteer work is probably around 80% of us that do. So it's something that we all really enjoy and we enjoy um, helping other people beyond ourselves. Next, we have youth are incapable of understanding complex or complicated issues. The reason behind this is that many adults don't give young people the chance or an opportunity to engage with these complicated or complex issues because many adults assume that youth just won't be able to take it. They won't be able to understand it or they're incapable um, of even getting whatever it is accomplished. But the truth is that CADCA, along with many other organizations nationwide, have engaged so many, in fact, tens of thousands of youth within policy work for over two decades. So this kind of policy work is not easy stuff to handle. This work, like we're gonna be talking about a little later, has to do with tobacco policy and all kinds of things that, met, that are not generally considered easy um, issues to deal with. But young people are able and capable of dealing with these issues and able um, to deal with a lot more complex issues as well. Ah, this as an adult is one that has bedeviled me and others in my field and countless young people, I'm sure, over the decades. This misconception that adults have to act youthy in order to engage youth that adults have to try and get down to the level of youth and say, I'm down with it, and that's bad, and I won't even do it, it'll make you cringe, and we'll see our numbers of participants start to drop if I do. This, this is still, unfortunately, a rather common misperception. Uh, we see youth uh, trainers, facilitators, speakers, motivational speakers, assembly leaders, you name it, um, think that they have to fall in this trap. In this case, I'm not even gonna go into the why and the reason. What we're gonna say here is, just don't do it. It's not necessary, it's disrespectful, it's cringy, and it's downright inappropriate. Youth expect us adults to be adults. We're there as guides. We have some wisdom and experience. Youth have some energy and idealism. Those combine to make a powerful uh, set of tools, but we do not have to be youthy or pretend we're youthy in order to engage youth. So the uh, response there is, let's just not do that. Now we have another poll coming up as we enter our um, time together looking at the historical um, fabric of youth involvement. Before we do that, we want to hear from you. It's kind of a nice idea to get a sense of where we are. Which decade is the one where you celebrated or when you celebrated your 16th birthday? Was it 1960s or earlier? All the way through the decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s? Or if you're not 16 now, there's an option for that as well. So let's see what we get and um, let us know when we've got a, a quorum there and we'll see what the results are. This gives us a good kind of demographic idea of where we're at. We'll just let it go for a couple of minutes show you how long I've been doing this work. When I started an activity like this, which we do in person, we'd have uh, 40s and 50s on there. Um, not as likely anymore. There are always outliers. Results, okay, thank you for posting those. Looks like we've, um, we've got a set of Gen Xers, it seems, and millennials for the most part the 2000s. It's a plurality, but it's only a small plurality. It's 28%. We do have um, some folks who are more boomers and silent. And what I'm really heartened to see, and I don't know, Rebecca, if you find the same, that we have um, a, a fifth of the folks with us today are, um, are still rather young people yourselves, um, celebrating the 16th birthday in the 2010s. That's great. We kind of did this, I'll give away the game a little bit. I did this because I often need a shot of inspiration to show and to prove to ourselves that young adults are getting into this field, that all the youth that we train through all of our projects and our CADCAs and our forums actually stay with this as active um, community um, advocates. So it looks like you have. Well, that's great. This, what we're gonna talk about applies to all of us. Next few slides. We're gonna start by talking about some of what the folks on the earlier end of that time spectrum did um, did encounter this historical perspective. 
what we see is an evolution, if you will, from what we call the education phase to the involvement phase, and then all the way to what we have now emerging, the engagement phase. And as I said, we're going really through the latter half of the 20th century into the first couple of decades of this one, where we see how youth were regarded one way and slowly begins to change. This uh, graphic that we're looking at here is directly from that CDC manual of best practices that we mentioned earlier. Um, and it goes into a great deal of more detail than I'll be able to with you on what some of the features of these different phases are. But we'll still wanna talk about them. Let's start, for example, with the education phase. This is a philosophy, if you will, a mindset with practices that flow from it, right? Of adults have the wisdom, adults have the knowledge, adults have the goods, and we dispense those to the young people. Young people often looked at as maybe the problem, the people that we need to correct, the people that we need to scold or cajole into doing the right behaviors. This education phase is the way public health, if you could even call it that, was regarding young people for quite a while. And there are still pockets of this country that do it this way. And I think you know that as well as I do, and we want to encourage them to grow. Examples would be anti-smoking or anti-drug lectures and assemblies. Honestly, I can't tell you how often folks call me and say, can you come and talk to our high school and set those kids straight about vaping? That's the education phase. The kids are doing a bad behavior. We call them kids. Somebody comes in and sets them straight. It's superficial, empty, and frankly, it doesn't really work. Substance prevention only in health class is another example. This is a way of saying anything about substances is all about just you as an individual young person, and the only ramifications are health, not justice, not equity, not policy, just health. And then of course, scare tactics, consequence-based preventions, consequences for the young people. If we have so-called prevention, where the idea is to crack down on the punishments for those kids doing those behaviors, that's an education phase. And we know that scare tactics can work in the short term, but when the cat's away, right? Scare tactics don't last. They have a splash, but they don't have ripples. So the problems, you've kind of covered these. Youth are given these adult know best messages in the education phase. Youth are passive. They're meant to be recipients of information and they're looked at as some kind of inherently deficient, inherently empty group of audiences there to receive information. Youth aren't given a voice. They're not given any opportunity to reflect, to put into practice, no agency, in other words. And we move from the education phase to what we call the involvement phase. Now, involvement sounds like a great word, and it's a lot better than the education phase. Let's be clear about that, but it's still not where we want to get. Involvement was really pioneered in the early 80s, and again, still very common in lots of pockets of the country today. Let's look at some of the features of involvement before Rebecca talks about engagement. Involvement is where youth are up there as spokespeople. Good so far, youth voice, all great. But in this case, with the involvement phase, the youth are still parroting scripts written for them specifically by adults without youth input. This is where the youth are essentially the puppets for the adult voices. However valid those voices might be, they might be great policy initiatives. They may be very correct and very compelling. But what distinguishes this is the youth themselves have not had input into the verbiage, into the wording. Another example are coalitions that recognize youth accomplishments only at fundraisers, only at events. This is where the star youth is looked at as a fundraising tool so that all the coalitions or all the folks around the community or the country can say, isn't this coalition great? Look what they've done for this youth. That's a bit dishonoring because it's not actually having the youth get up there themselves and talk from their heart about what they've done. It's using youth as somewhat prompts. Another example of youth involvement is peer-to-peer -peer education with curriculum created by adults. This is part of that misconception that we sometimes have that youth will only listen to other youth. 
We know that's not true. You can listen to anyone who's compelling and relevant and relatable and present. But this idea is that youth educate each other so they think it's all youth driven. But again, adults have written the curriculum. Adults have not had input from young people in the curriculum. So it's still superficial. It is better than the education phase, but it's still superficial. So we've kind of covered what the problems are really with involvement or the limits might even be a better word. Youth are still given that message. Adults know best. We know what's best. We just want your help in doing it. As opposed to let's develop together what's best. Let's all of us look out there and see what's going on in the communities um, and make some initiatives about policy based on that. So youth still have adults know best in this phase. Youth are given a superficial and often a quick to wear off sense of their value. Youth are given the sense that their value to a coalition is in their visibility as a prop rather than in the real ideas, energy, um, inspiration that they have authentically from themselves. And lastly, and this one is a tricky one. This one is a tricky one. Lastly, only the so-called superstar youth who fit a desired mold are cultivated and given training or policy initiative opportunities. Nothing wrong with highly accomplished young people. In fact, some of my favorite people across the country I work with are highly accomplished young people. It's just that it's not the only game in town. Youth involvement limits the participation from those um, youth from oppressed, marginalized, disenfranchised communities. It limits youth participation from cultures that mainstream prevention might have found traditionally uncomfortable or scary. It doesn't provide that grounding principle that we talked about about 15 minutes ago, health equity. Equity means everyone's welcome. It means the superstars, bless them, are welcome, and so are the alternative ones that may be more challenging to work with because they have input that's valid too. So let's talk about some uh, involvement activities, Rebecca. Yeah, so when you all were teenagers, or for those of you who might still be in your teen years, um, what type of activities were you most, or are you most involved in? First being athletics, whether this be a specific sport like basketball, football, soccer, track and field, or another kind of sport or sports team. Maybe this is extra um, academic extracurriculars like the debate team or Model United Nations, student government, or the school newspaper. Maybe this is more of like an artistic um, point of view or like more artistic based activities like fine arts or visual arts, including musical theater, choir, dance, painting, drawing, or anything of that nature. Um, D, maybe this was volunteer work or community service, or E, other. I was involved in a different kind of activity, or maybe you worked some kind of other type of part-time job. So we'll give you just a quick minute to fill that out, and we will go over the results um, then. Hmm. All right. So it seems like our majority here was involved in athletics, about 36%. So a little bit over a third. Um, academic extracurriculars, uh, small portion, but strong 12%. Fine arts or visual arts, about 26%. Very cool. And volunteer work or other is split. Um, kind of around the same, 12 and 13%. And I was reading a lot of your chats. I did see that um, there are many of you who are involved in multiple activities, um, which is awesome. But thank you all just for sharing um, just a little bit about yourselves with us. All right, thank you. We're gonna talk a little about now the engagement phase. I'm gonna be turning it over to Rebecca in a moment to talk about what some of the hallmarks of actual youth engagement. We'll talk about this together. But remember where we've come from youth are the problem to youth are great spokespeople. Now it's youth are equal partners 
in health equity. Youth are equal partners in policy development. Youth are equal partners in the work that we do. This is by far the most challenging phase, um, hence a webinar today about it. So one of the things, Rebecca, would you like to take this? I know that you've done some of this, so I'm curious to hear um, that input in the spirit of our engagement. Of course. So just some examples of youth engagement include youth writing their own scripts and youth having to write um, their own opinions down and really just take that autonomy and sense of independence um, to express their genuine and passionate voices. Like Nigel kind of said before, youth involvement is more so about the adult kind of standing behind them, perhaps even giving them the script. But when we hand over the baton to youth in order for them to be independently engaged, that's when we can um, see that youth voices will really be highlighted and that authentic, genuine passion will be highlighted as well. So another example of youth engagement includes collaboration. Like Nigel had also said before, with youth involvement, there is not as much collaboration as we would like to see with these kinds of things like policies and other objectives. But with engagement, we see that um, youth and adults are collaborating with one another, seeing each other as, as equals and collaborating and brainstorming equal ideas in order to form one bigger picture and great idea with the help of one another. And, you know, as, as Rebecca is saying, and something to, to highlight too on this is that this isn't come up with policies just based on what we think will work, whether we're adults or young people. It's still based on the evidence. It's still based on the data. It's still based on real world information and what can be done to solve real world problems. It's just that youth and adults are doing it together. Sometimes people can take kind of a, a wonky turn on this that isn't really effective when we say, oh, we'll just ask the youth what they think needs to happen. Well, we look at the data and we all determine together what happens. Yes, exactly. And another example of youth engagement to keep in mind is that youth and adults are carrying this equal set, um, sense of responsibility and accountability when outlining these objectives and goals and when working and collaborating with one another. So this is not looking down on people who are younger um, from like an adult perspective, nor is this looking up if you were a youth looking up to someone who's an adult. It's looking at each other um, from kind of an equal perspective and sharing um, the, those sets of responsibilities and that sense of um, accountability for the work that is taking place. Florida and California have done great tobacco work right there with what Rebecca's talking about. Mm. We'll talk about some of the benefits now of youth engagement, doing a bit of a, an advert for why, besides the obvious it's the right thing to do, why this really helps your coalition. I'll talk about the benefits to prevention in general. Rebecca will talk about benefits to youth uh, themselves, and we'll both talk about the benefits to the wider community. That this isn't just fun, although it is a lot of fun. This isn't just the right thing to do, although it is that. This actually is efficacious. This actually helps our efforts uh, work out better, helps us to better outcomes. Youth add value to our prevention work. They add true quantifiable value by projecting powerful, authentic voices, by projecting voices not that actually talk about the problems and talk about the issues in the community by people who are directly impacted by them. Youth can add value also to prevention work by exposing in ways that adults can't as easily the manipulative tactics that the tobacco and I would say the alcohol and cannabis industries as well have in terms of promoting their products. Youth can say, this is what these ads mean to me and my friends. This is how we see them in a way that adults, we actually can say that not with quite as much authenticity because we are not the targets. Youth obviously add enthusiasm, authenticity, energy, idealism, tempered by adult experience. And so we might be wondering how else youth may add value to prevention work. And Nigel had just explained before that youth are so valuable in prevention work by adding these, this sort of genuine and authentic passion behind everything that they put into the field. So 
First, youth can provide real and true insight about what is going on with their peers. Because adults don't get to interact with um, young people like youth do with their peers, the young voice behind what is happening and what they see is happening to their friends and to their classmates is what we should really be focusing on because it's in a way seeing, seeing what is happening from a different and more genuine and authentic lens. And bringing a new perspective to these kinds of unique challenges that begin to develop is also something that youth can truly um, create a great impact on. So the young perspective might be really different from something an adult might see. Because as times change, as um, people get older, um, there could be some kind of difference between how an adult might look at a certain situation and how a young person living through it might look at a certain situation. And with this being said, youth are powerful because we can generate, generate some great and innovative ideas on how to tackle these problems from their core, having been the ones to witness it and having been the ones to witness it as we interact with our peers and with our fellow classmates. We also look at the fact that what we wanna do in prevention is build support and buy-in through a wider community. And it's not very effective if in a given community, maybe the prevention coalition is fully on board, understands upstream um, interventions, understands health equity, uh, has, uh, is raring to go and, and do their initiatives, but the wider community hasn't bought in. There's a gap. Often young people can be the ones to bridge that gap. Build that support among the public in your community for prevention, for health promotion, for social justice, for equity, for all of these issues, because there's no other way to put it. Young people have a degree of fed upness about business as usual, that some of us, as we become adults and buy in, can lose that edge. We need that edge. That bridges that gap. It's also an enhancement to credibility among funders. That genuine, authentic youth engagement, not tokenistic, not just having the youth up there giving their speeches and receiving their clapping, but actually being in the group with their sleeves rolled up, that enhances our credibility as a coalition among our funders, especially the CDC. So that is something that we want to make sure that we understand about youth involvement and engagement. And we're growing and cultivating and supporting and eventually stepping out of the way for that next generation of leaders in tobacco prevention, in public health generally, in social justice generally, in prevention generally. And when I do um, youth workshops, I often say your homework, it's very simple before we meet again, is to save the world. And frankly, that next generation of leaders is who's going to do that. So we're cultivating and building those leaders. Also mobilizing and leading peers. Um, Rebecca, as a, a peer with that, I'll, I'll defer to you on that one. Yeah, I think the true value of getting young people, um, and I did see a chat question about this, like what is the age of youth? Well, really I started working in this field probably when I was around 11 or 12 and I'm 17 now. So I would say anywhere from like middle school range to high school range when we refer to the term youth. But mobilizing and leading peers, um, just sort of getting that sense of autonomy and being able to develop those leadership skills is something that is truly valuable to prevention work. Just because like we had said before, um, youth get to really see the behind the scenes of all of this and get to see what is occurring um, within um, their communities in relation to peers and their classmates and things that the, they are involved in. And adding this sense of like unique skills and experience um, to prevention work that could be perhaps even a little outdated because youth have this sort of new and fresh kind of mindset, we can contribute a lot of really valuable opinions or ideas to um, a field that, to certain um, ideas in this field that might be a little bit outdated for the time that is now, or like for a more contemporary kind of mindset. And finally, increasing the um, commitment of adults to tobacco control and other kinds of participation involvement in public health. Um, with this being said, just because it talks about adult commitment, Nigel, would you like to tune in on this and just give your opinion on this? I'll give a little slice of history, Rebecca, that um, working with young people such as Rebecca and her peers is what brought me back into the field. 
there's a quite literal, honest um, piece of history I can say that I was prepared to leave the field some years ago and it was seeing what young people were doing and how young people were actively engaging and the passion, energy, um, excitement that they brought that, uh, that reignited my own commitment as a trainer, educator, advocate for working with young people. So um, it's, it's very real. There's nothing's going to re-solidify an adult's commitment to this field than seeing what young people are doing in collaboration with adults. Wow, wonderfully said. Thank you so much, Nigel. And now I'm just gonna touch a little bit about the benefits um, of youth engagement to youth themselves. So firstly, youth engagement builds self-confidence. It builds the sense of capability. Whereas before with youth involvement, there was a lot of this sense of like, I can't do this. I need an adult to guide me through this, to hold my hand. Youth engagement is really taking the reins um, and youth really being able to develop that sense of autonomy. Um, and leading into our next point, youth engagement builds the sense of independence and autonomy in youth being able to do things on their own and being able to be their own leaders and to lead other people as well. Finally, youth engagement also connects young people to their communities. Um, so these sort of like meaningful, long lasting connections is really why I personally have stayed um, working in this field for six or seven years. I just really love um, everyone I work with. I, I love being able to meet new people on a daily basis. It's, it's really just one of those things that um, could be such a highlight of my day. And to touch also on that sort of self-confidence piece, when I, was, when I was younger, probably around 11 or 12 when I started working, I was not confident and I was very, very shy, so shy that I would beg my mom to like not take me to school in the mornings. But I can confidently say that nowadays I'm just a little different, just a little bit more talkative, but um, I, I really do love um, what I do. And I know the most rewarding part of what I do is getting to work with other people who have went, gone through the same kind of metamorphosis and process. And just through being so engaged within my community, that has sort of brought out um, this sense of wanting to, wanting to make it better and wanting to meet all sorts of people. And really just, again, kind of strengthen that self-confidence within myself. Um, but moving on, we have some more benefits to how youth engagement can benefit youth themselves. So. Youth engagement builds these leadership skills in youth leading other people and youth being able to grow um, as leaders themselves. This is something that is so crucial to the development of really strong leaders and really young leaders within communities. And then also youth engagement builds these kind of problem solving and um, organizational skills that we see um, are needed in coalition work and are needed in these um, community-based projects that we involve ourselves in. But as youth become more experienced in these sort of community projects and in leading other people, their set of like tools and set of skills within their personal toolbox expands. And finally, youth engagement builds public presentation skills and just the overall comfortability of people, um, of young people meeting new people, meeting faces and um, making new friends. I would not have been able to do something like this six years ago, but this is just something that I love doing. And it's so fun getting to interact with you, even if it's on a virtual platform. But it goes to show you just really um, how these kinds of experience can help youth in ways that are um, not only beyond themselves, but also to just grow um, within themselves as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, as, as Rebecca used this word a lot in, in this piece, skills, skills, skills. Um, any of us that grew up in prevention work, we know that uh, skills, opportunities to practice them and bonding with adults um, to, to actually exercise those skills, that's prevention. What we're doing with youth involvement and youth engagement especially is bridging that individual prevention for the youth to a wider upstream environmental prevention about all of us. Building skills, building skills, building skills. And only because I know Rebecca not to be a dishonest person, I believe that she was shy years ago. If I didn't know that, I'd have a hard time believing it, but I believe you. Yep, um, I truly was. But um, so this quote, um, I think, Nigel, I'm going to hand this over to you. I think you have a little yeah. more experience with this one than me. 
Well, this is just, um, this is one of many little gems, little nuggets from the CDC best practice manual. They have, when, when someone has a way of putting things better than I think I can, which happens a lot, um, I like to highlight that. And this is just such a cogent way of putting it, that young people who are given opportunities to contribute to positive community health outcomes can also benefit their communities through continued civic engagement. It's, it's that beautiful feedback loop. We have so much in our, in our culture, in our politics, in our institutions where we have negative feedback loops that it's really nice, I find, really inspiring to look at a positive loop like this. Cultivate the youth and their skills, that ends up creating a better community because they help us develop policies, which again leads us to successes where we cultivate more youth and those things feed off each other. So this is, um, this is just one of those quotes that I think puts it so well. And when I see a piece of good societal news these days, I want to fly it from the rooftops. And so that's what this is, a piece of good societal news flying it from the rooftop. rooftop. So we'll look at now some of the differences um, in the specific elements with youth involvement versus youth engagement. We've walked you through some of the philosophical differences and they're important to set the stage, but where we're gonna go now is the rubber hits the road differences. How specifically are the roles of youth and adults different? How specifically are the mechanisms for developing policy different? So youth involvement, kind of the old way, again, I'm not saying it's bad, it's just a little outdated, to youth engagement, the new way. So we'll look at some specific differences, not just philosophical, but actually practical. I'll take the youth involvement ones and Rebecca's gonna give the kind of shiny side of the coin for the youth engagement ones. So with typical youth involvement, as we have seen it over the years, I certainly was brought up as a preventioneer in this world, we see that the roles of young people, they're participants. Now that's a heck of a lot better than audiences only. It's a lot better, but it's still participants rather than, well, Rebecca will talk about the other side. The roles of young people, in typical youth involvement, young people receive the information and help the adults. We say, for example, we have a great youth group in our coalition, they're helping us so much. They really are taking in this information, they're participating, and they're really helping us develop what we want to. Whereas with engagement, so with youth engagement, we are all about trying to like rebrand how we see young people and rebrand those kinds of labels that um, youth had been, that had been put on youth before with what Nigel was explaining with youth involvement. But with youth engagement, we see that youth are not just kind of like a sidekick. Youth are rather equal partners that are sharing that sort of responsibility and are collaborating with adults. Youth and adults also share equally providing information and collaborating with one another. Um, this includes any kinds of goals and the, or like any outcomes that both of them wish to see, that both um, youth and adults wish to collaborate with one another to see as an overall outcome or as an overall goal in the end. And finally, youth and adults want to help one another in supporting and encouraging each other's goals, um, which is truly with the aim of just trying um, to to set a overall goal through collaborating with one another and setting a goal that they can accomplish with the help and support of each other. Perfect. If this, for example, were a youth and involvement uh, webinar, it would be Nigel, the adult presenting and Rebecca helping. Ooh, it makes me cringe to even think of that because that's not how it is. In this case, it's two people. One happens to be in his late 20s, I'm a little older actually, and one happens to be a young person, but we're sharing with each other. There's no hierarchy of power and value, there's just differences in role. Now again, in typical youth involvement, let's look at how the differences show up in terms of how decisions are made, how priorities are set, how choices are made that govern the operations of the coalition and what they're doing. In typical youth involvement, the adults make the decisions. Now, they may have input from the youth. In fact, hopefully they do. Otherwise, we're way back in the education phase. But it's just input and final veto power, as it were, rests with the adults. Not with the data, but with what the adults want. So the youth input can be minimal. It can be tokenistic. It can be adultistic. 
where there's this inherent belief that young people's value is less than adults simply because they've been alive a shorter time, a false belief, a huge false belief. Decision-making in typical youth involvement often uses that phrase, which is very overused, and I encourage us not to overuse it, need to know basis. We say, look, we don't need to trouble the youth with all the data stuff and all the research. They don't need to know that. What they need to know is we're changing the world. They do perhaps need to know all of those details and maybe can know them and analyze them better than adults can. So with typical youth involvement, that need to knowism is used as a way to exclude, marginalize and disenfranchise young people under the cloak of involving them. Whereas, so with decision-making and youth engagement, we see that decisions are collaborative because again, adults and youths um, are equal when they are working with one another. Youth and adults also have equal input and equal accountability. So if something goes wrong, it's not just the fault of the youth, it's also the fault of the adult. And equally, if someone, um, or not someone, if something goes right or if some some sort of outcome turns out the way um, that a youth and adult who worked together had wanted. Um, this is like a shared accountability and shared um, responsibility in having this um, turn out correctly and turn out the way that they had wanted to see their end goal. And then decision making is also completely transparent. So on the youth side, the, um, they're being as communicative as they can be. And uh, from the adult side, they're also communicating with the youth and not thinking like, oh, they can't handle it. Oh, like, I don't think that they can handle it. I'll just do it myself. Rather, this sort of communication is completely transparent and is completely um, visible between both parties. And it's worth saying here that some of us might have experienced um, that uh, cohesive, collaborative decision-making, consensus-based decision-making, transparent decision-making, it can be harder. It can be more onerous. It requires more effort. It's tougher stuff. Usually the right thing, the effective thing is harder and that's okay. Now we look at typical youth involvement in terms of how goals, priorities, outcomes are set. It's pretty simplistic here, pretty straightforward. In typical youth involvement, adults set the strategy based on what they've done the research, because remember, we've excluded the young people from the research because need to know. The adults set the strategy, set the priority. The youth input's limited to issues that adults think of as youthy. Oh, if we need to have a youth dance, then we'll involve the, adult, uh, the youth. Oh, social media, then we'll bring them in. I can't tell you just from personal experience working in this field, how many times I've gone to a coalition somewhere in the country and they don't really activate their youth group or their youth coalition or their youth club until they're gonna do a social media campaign. And often I'm the one to say, where were the youth before this? Where were the youth in determining what's gonna be said and why you say it? Why are you only bringing in the youth when you're saying they know social media, we don't, we'll give it to them. So typical youth involvement only brings the youth on board when we adults deem it youthy enough. So the youth therefore don't have a lot of say in prioritizing. They're brought on to exercise and execute goals that we've already determined need to be. We adults, not just the data, which we all look at, but adults based on our own opinions and biases. Whereas... So as Nigel's explained before um, with youth involvement, we see this theme of like, a lot of exclusion. It's a very like exclusionary kind of process with um, the adults kind of taking the reins and again, the youth just being these helpers. But with youth engagement, this theme is more inclusionary um, from the youth side, um, from the youth's point of view. We see that both youth and adults are equally working and collaborating with one another and that these, um, this kind of strategic planning or looking at a community and assessing a community, which we will get a little further into later, is collaborative and is evidence-based. So not just assuming that a youth can't understand the kind of research that is being conducted, that they can take on this, um, take on this responsibility and that they can work with adults to most effectively plan. Youth can also have, youth should also have an input at every stage in this process, because if we are trying to be truly collaborative with both adults and with youth, then youth should have an input in doing so. 
And finally, youth have, should have equal say in setting these priorities and assigning tasks. This is also about that youth leadership piece. If we give youth um, the responsibility and give them the opportunity to grow as leaders, then they can gain that experience. And again, like Nigel had emphasized before, gain the skill, gain these leadership, fundamental leadership skills that are needed in order to create community change. So it's sometimes people ask, um, uh, and legitimately so, so are, are, are the youth in charge? Are the adults in charge? Are they in charge together? I would say the evidence is in charge. The data is in charge. The real world conditions are in charge and youth and adults are equal partners in responding to that so that we can change it. It's not about just because a youth says something it's automatically correct or incorrect. It's likewise with an adult. The data and the evidence are in charge. So we'll talk about here, so you want to start a youth club in your prevention coalition. What are the steps that we need to take? And this again is directly from the CDC user guide. I've even referenced some pages. I don't know if GIA slash CADCA might get that out to folks, but if you have access to that, there's a whole section about preparing to engage youth, assessing our capacities to do that. So First, what we want to do in terms of a um, capacity assessment, ask the question, why? That may seem um, obvious. That may seem something that we can just gloss right over, but we can. Why really do we want to engage youth in the first place? And we need to be honest with ourselves and our governing boards and our stakeholders and our funders about this. Are we engaging youth because we've been told to? Are we engaging youth because we know it's the right thing to do? Are we engaging youth because all the other coalitions seem to be doing it and we go to conferences and we feel behind? Those are all legitimate. Even we're doing it because we have to is legitimate, but we wanna be able to face head on what exactly is our reason for wanting to engage youth. Why are we doing it? That will determine, that will color in how we end up doing that. So asking the question, why? Why are we wanting to do this? Once we've gotten some ideas about why, a next question that often follows from why is the implementation question of how. Again, it's one of those questions and one of those issues that could seem pretty straightforward, could even seem obvious, um, but it isn't. We wouldn't have it here. How exactly do we want to engage youth? Are we looking at youth engagement for a single event? And I don't just mean a public information event, but I mean a single advocacy event, a single campaign, if you will, and that's fine. Or are we wanting to engage the youth long-term so we have a folded in, fully integrated youth component in our coalitions? That's also fine. I would say that's slightly more fine, but single event, single campaign or long-term, because answering this question, determining this with your stakeholders, this is going to influence how you recruit, where you recruit, what expectations you give to young people. We're not gonna to say to young people, you're gonna be involved for a whole long time if in fact, we just need them for this one campaign. If we're upfront and honest, then we're respecting the youth enough that they can make their own decision of how much they wanna participate. So we ask why, we ask how, and we ask what. What strengths does our organization or our coalition, whatever our, whatever our um, uh, holding object is for our work, what strengths do we have and how can these help us to actively engage youth? Are we a coalition that's had some really good track record with gathering and analyzing data? Are we a coalition that's had a really good track record with recruiting people from all sectors and not just CADCA's delineated sectors, but all sectors? Are we a coalition that's really managed to cross cultural um, barriers and gulfs and bridges and be able to bring a whole community on board? Whatever our unique strengths are, and the other side of that coin is our unique challenges or growth areas, we want to be honest about those because those will help us, again, with whom we recruit, how we recruit them, where we go to find them, and most of all, how we respectively and authentically engage them once we've got them. So we talk about why do we want to do this at all, how and what mechanisms do we want to engage our youth in, and then what do we have that we can bring to bear. If anyone's looking at this and saying, I'm getting a strategic prevention framework vibe off of all this, 
Right, you are. It's that same process, isn't it? It's what do we have that we need to fix? What are the strengths that we bring to bear on that? And then how do we plan, implement, evaluate, and ensure cultural relevance in all of it? It's really similar. So we've done the why, the how, and the what. Now we talk about the other side of that coin of strength. What obstacles to youth engagement have we encountered in the past? And maybe we take the word we here and we expand it beyond just our coalition. Maybe we say our community. What are some areas that our community may have dropped the ball with young people? What are some areas maybe that youth engagement hasn't worked out the way we've wanted to? What obstacles and what challenges? Now, sometimes we're a little remiss to publicize our obstacles and challenges because we think that we want to just highlight all of our strengths and not talk about the challenges, but we must in this case. Really facing those challenges and saying, this is how we overcame them, or honestly, folks, Sometimes it's, this is how we didn't, we're stumped. If it's real and authentic, that's okay. But what obstacles are there? I've been to, as many of us probably have um, in this virtual room, quite a number of CADCA forums, um, summits, uh, mid-year trainings, and seen a lot of workshops, wonderful workshops, amazing, inspiring workshops. Sometimes I get this sense that a lot of them are all about what our strengths as a group are. These are the things we did. I would love to hear more about these are the challenges we have. These are the challenges we still have. This is where we're stuck, let's help each other. Because taking an honest look at that helps us recruit, keep and engage young people in a way that really brings them authentic, meaningful engagement. And then once we've talked about, all right, what are our challenges? What are our obstacles? And how do those uh, fold into the strengths that we need to overcome them? Now we talk about, who in the community can help with this effort? This is, in other words, we do an assessment of our allies. Who's already out there that can actually help our efforts to engage youth? What youth serving organizations are there? What youth mentors are there? And remember, we're not just going to look in the traditional areas. Are there people who are coaches? Um, are there people who run youth outreach ministries, religious based or not? Are there people who do street outreach for youth that are homeless? Are there LGBTQ plus advocates out there that work with young people? Let's really make that net as wide as it can be. So I, I don't like the word net because that kind of implies we're trapping. I think of a parachute. Let's expand that parachute so that we can all be underneath it together. Who's out there working on it? And the answer is a lot of you right out there now listening to us are these people that we're talking about, are the ones and each other. So we've done an assessment of why do we want to involve youth, in what manner, in other words, the how. We've talked about what are some of the unique strengths that we have to bring to bear and what are some of the challenges. We've taken a look at who are the allies that we might get on board or get on board with them. Now it's time to say, all right, we've got our allies in, in line here. What can we offer to them? Why should an ally organization work with the Nigel Coalition here to engage youth? What is the reason that my or our group is the one that can really spearhead this? And if we don't have a really good mission and vision and data-driven answer to this question, we're not gonna get very far. What can we offer to community partners? What are the things that we've had particular success with? Hint, it's usually youth. Once we've determined that, you wanna talk about, all right, what do we actually say? What are the messages that we want to actually communicate to these leaders and allies in our community? So we've got to the point now, we're forming our youth club or our youth coalition or our youth group. We know that we have to be very intentional about recruiting um, so that we have an authentic engagement. We also know that we wanna make sure decision-making is integrated and transparent and collaborative, all the things that Rebecca was explaining to us. Now we want to sell that message. And yeah, the word really is sell. At this point, we're doing some social marketing to the community at large about why we want to uh, involve and engage young people. Uh, the benefits to the work, to youth, to the community in general. Um, well, a great thing here is you have a nice already recorded cheat sheet about this that we just took you through. Um, we, Rebecca and I, talked about some of the concrete benefits to the prevention field to youth themselves and to the community. 
you in the unique language of the culture of your community, of the region of your community, of the history of your community. You decide how you sing those praises of youth engagement. If you're thinking you could do it just off of a template, that's not necessarily correct. You want to do it your way that speaks to the people in your community. And anytime, Rebecca, I think if I see you on mute, I know you want to jump in. That's totally fine, either way. Um, so we've talked about how we're going to spread the message of why this is such a good idea. Now we spread the message of how to do it. This is now where the ball is going to be in your court on talking authentically about what specific activities young people can do. And we're going to get to some of those in a minute and we'll see and I'll make sure that we have time for that. And we want to make sure we communicate the reality that youth are the authentic, effective vehicle for this. And lastly, no one's going to be on board if they don't see the benefits to their credibility, to their funding and to their sustainability. See, we're wrapping up that strategic prevention framework type model here. We want to communicate to the leaders why we want youth, how we're going to use them, how we'll overcome barriers, and how you, community members, will benefit. That takes work. Who do you think is a really good uh, sector of the population that can help you develop these messages? The hint is it starts with why and it rhymes with truth. So let's talk about some of the specific roles that youth can take in the next um, 20 minutes or so. We're going to go through specific youth roles and then supportive adult roles. So youth are active in a lot of different roles here. I think I'm going to turn over to Rebecca here to start talking about what are some of the, um, the roles. Yes, exactly, Nigel. Um, so we've been talking a lot about trying to change our perspective of how we see youth when it comes to prevention. And in this sense, we can also um, kind of adapt this mindset that youth can take on multiple roles just as adults can take on multiple roles. The first being youth being researchers. So what can youth exactly do as researchers? Well, the answer is youth can do a lot of things while working in research. For one, youth can conduct these sort of community assessments, look at the data on their community and sort of form um, a research piece together based on relevant um, and personal community data that they are seeing. As well, youth can also survey different attitudes about various substances that are within their communities. For many, this might be alcohol, tobacco, vapes, marijuana. There's a wide variety of substances um, being used, obviously, and how it relates to each community is different. So youth can kind of take the reins on this and really investigate the attitudes that are within their community on different substances. Youth can also research price and promotion policies. So um, as we see here, there are multiple convenience stores that sell substances um, across the nations, across the nation, obviously. And youth can be the ones to kind of go in and investigate if these sort of stores are um, upholding their policies of not serving to anyone under age. Or if they, are, um, if they are doing so, they can bring this to the attention and really spotlight that this is a problem occurring within their communities. This is as upstream as it gets right here, what Rebecca is talking about. The perfect definition of that upstream initiative. And youth can also research the outlet density um, as well as practices that are occurring within their respective communities. Meaning if there are tons of different um, stores that are marketing towards youth very obviously, perhaps if there's a tobacco store um, that is selling different um, vape products um, that is across the street from an elementary school or across the street from a high school, this is something that is obviously um, outlet density. Or if there is more um, than one um, maybe cannabis store in a town or a cannabis store on every block of a certain town. We can see that there is an obvious sort of trend occurring within certain communities, especially with commercialization within states that have commercialized recreational cannabis. Um, is, that's just something to note as well. And this is a role that youth can take on in just seeing where these stores sort of set up and how um, dense they are in proximity to one another within their respective communities. 
That's a great health equity thing there, isn't it? It's, it's notice that a lot of these stores are concentrated in places that already are lower income. Sometimes communities who are disenfranchised, communities of color tend to be preyed on more. Youth are great eyes and ears to, to determine that. Mm -hmm. And with all that being said, youth can also gather this data about the effectiveness of these current retail um, policies. So Nigel kind of touched on this before, but a huge strategy of, of big tobacco that we had seen um, throughout many years, um, throughout many decades as well, is marketing towards young people in order to make them addicted throughout their entire life. And this is something that a youth might be able to recognize, especially with um, the commercialization of cannabis. A lot of youth have been able to recognize like, hey, these cool candies with THC and high contents of THC, um, these edibles, these flavored cereals with THC is not necessarily something that's marketed towards an older adult audience. It's very obviously marketed towards myself. And this is something that youth can investigate from their perspective and from the way that they see it. And youth can also assess um, the kind of support that is within a community for changing these policies around substances that are most commonly used or that are most commonly normalized within um, a community. So whether this be alcohol, whether this be tobacco, um, in my state, because I'm from Illinois, we had worked in my coalition on raising the um, age to buy tobacco from 18 to 21 through Tobacco 21, and we were actually successful in doing so. So that was a huge accomplishment on our part, but something that I think was really important in doing that was us all taking a step back and recognizing that tobacco was such a normalized substance within my own community. So if youth are able to do this in um, their own communities as well, we will see that the policy, um, the different policies and the community support for such will, will increase and change um, as youth further assess and investigate this problem. So now I think Nigel is going to take us through kind of the education side of how youth can be involved with in educating others in their community and with educating their peers as well. Um, you bet. Thanks. Um, thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for that piece. This is the, the youth as educators, notice how we've really flipped to youth being the, the topic, the, the focus of education to youth being the people who are doing the educating. That's a full circle, kind of a, a nice 180 from where we were with youth education phase um, historically. So yeah, youth can be effective peer-to-peer -peer educators. We know that youth will often listen to other youth they find dynamic and, and, um, and relatable. But I wanna put a caveat in here. We're talking about peer-to-peer -peer education about the system, peer-to-peer -peer education about what policies are, peer-to-peer -peer education about how to get involved in changing policy. This isn't just peer-to-peer -peer education and here's why you shouldn't smoke, here's why you shouldn't drink. Nothing wrong with that, but it's way incomplete. When we talk peer-to-peer -peer education, we're talking youth educating each other about changing systems the kind of thing that Rebecca has said she's been involved in too. But youth can educate not just each other, but the wider community on things like the secondary and the environmental harms of substances, particularly with Juul and other vape products. We know that those discarded pods that had the um, vape juice in them, as well as the Juuls themselves with their battery, those are hazardous waste. Those things should not be in landfills. There is currently no turn in place for those. Those actually are harmful to the groundwater. They're harmful to um, the environment around. They're colorful. Kids will pick those up and put them in their mouth because um, they who wouldn't if you're a little child? They're appealing and they're plastic and they're colorful. They look just like Lego blocks. Actually, youth educating the um, community on why this is such a dangerous thing to have it litter all around. It's a great um, effort for young people. Also, youth can educate decision makers, not just public officials, but private corporate decision makers on crafting language that works. Sometimes the youth, if they've done the research on what actually the definitions are policy-wise for what things mean, they can go in there and say, well, here on um, this store, you've decided that you're going to limit your advertising to this high, but by advertising, are you also including the little banners on the sides of the dispensers? Oh, that counts too. Let's put those up. Youth can actually be the ones that proofread those policies to avoid loopholes. 
An example was uh, a few years ago in Iowa, and we probably have some Iowa people with us today. They know a lot more about this than I do. Um, a group called ISTEP from the um, Iowa Department of Public Health, these youth wrote to Dollar General, one of those discount dollar store chains, we probably, most of us have those in our communities, requesting that they limited or got rid of their tobacco ads in this one particular store in um, Iowa. In doing that, in researching what counted as a tobacco ad, what the verbiage was, what the placement was, what the actual law said a tobacco ad looked like, they presented that to this one Dollar Tree store and the outcome was, that, or Dollar General, sorry, Dollar General across the state of Iowa stopped their tobacco uh, prevention. It was because the youth had done their homework and actually knew what words to say to get them to do that. The youth deserve all the credit for that one. Youth can also educate property owners on how to help institute policies where people are smoke free who are tenants uh, where they live. We know that health outcomes of um, buildings where people can smoke or use tobacco in any way are worse. And we know that a lot of lower income disenfranchised people more often live in rental housing. So youth can educate landlords in how without being dictatorial and without actually um, risking eviction, help their tenants to be on board with smoke free rental policies. And of course, back to peer-to-peer -peer education here, we have youth can train their own leadership teams in advocacy skills. Sometimes an adult like that strange man in the green shirt and the pink shorts that you see at the bottom of your screen there can come in and help the youth train each other, but the youth can be great trainers for one another about advocacy skills, about all the things we've been talking about so far. Now we have organizers. Rebecca, I want to tell us a couple of pieces about youth as organizers. It looks like we've got about 10 minutes to do this and a couple of adult role things and see if we have a question or two. So, of I'm course. Gonna so now we're just going to investigate another role um, that youth can take on, which is being organizers and leaders within their communities. So these are two images that Nigel had kind of touched on before, um, but these are most commonly seen, these little sort of jewel pods full of nicotine and also other substance related trash that can't be recycled or that um, can't, it, it just can't be taken in um, by any means by the environment. So it's horrible for the environment, but youth can organize ways to um, collect this trash and sort of um, clean up their communities and help out the environment in doing so. And a little personal story about these. I used to walk to school when I, um, when I was going to school in person um, quite a long time ago, but I used to see these little jewel pods on the side of the road almost every day. And I remember just seeing them and like walking by and more and more and more would add up. And the problem with them is these things cannot just be taken in by the environment. They're not by any means recyclable or natural. So this is also a really important um, component in order to just keep communities clean and in order for youth to be um, engaged in doing so and being able to organize a way to keep their communities clean as well. Youth can also organize and manage different um, events related to community awareness and advocacy. So this meaning that um, youth are responsible for organizing these huge community-wide events that many can come to, and then they can be the educators themselves um, in organizing these events, and then also propelling that information forward into their communities through educating those who come and those who are attendees at these types of events. And along with these kinds of community events, youth can also organize and hold news conferences about any sort of topic that matters to them, whether it's related to substance abuse prevention or whether it is something that they feel really passionately about. Um, personally, my coalition actually hosted a couple of news conferences when the commercialization of cannabis was really popular um, when within um, Illinois. This was like a couple years ago, but we had a huge part of organizing these news conferences, of reaching out to people, of talking to different journalists. So this just really goes to show that youth can have a really big voice in organizing these sort of larger than um, just community level conferences and events as well. So, oh, oh sorry, Nigel, go ahead. 
No, I, I just want to reiterate what you said. I think that it's youth aren't just the ones who attend these things. Youth organize them and put them together. Just listening to Rebecca, I want to I want to join her group right now. Just hearing that. So, <laughs> but the organizers, not just the attendees. Mm -hmm. Precisely. And along the um, along these lines, and just kind of related to that idea, similarly, youth can also organize protests and other kinds of public actions. So. Now we've kind of compiled this list for ourselves of what youth can organize and what youth can lead themselves, which include protests, public events, community events, and news conferences. So these are all just really great examples of how youth can be organizers and leaders within their communities. And then also fun ones. I think that that is something that is just not emphasized enough. There are so many different kinds of fun events um, that a community can embrace and that can really attract multiple people within a community. So I think here is just an example of some kind of race, which is something that's really fun. It's something that's healthy and good aerobic exercise. Um, something that my coalition personally did within my community a couple years ago, because again, from Illinois, so it gets pretty cold here in the winters, but I think we did some sort of hot chocolate, um, outdoor hot chocolate event, and we had like a huge tent, and there was lots of candy and chocolate, and um, lots of kids came, even adults loved it. So there are so many examples of fun things that um, young people can organize that will really bring a community together. And our final piece here, um, oh, actually one of our final pieces here we have as advocates, which Nigel is going to lead us through. And it's really what we've been talking about, isn't it? The whole time, youth advocating for change, youth not just being the ones that listen to why things need to change, but the ones that tell adults, decision makers, policy makers, uh, what the change needs to be. Youth providing testimony. People will listen to the voices of young people, especially the authentic voices that young people have scripted for themselves based on data when they're actually advocating for changing policy. I think the uh, picture on the left there is Illinois, if I'm not mistaken. Might yeah, I, I think I'm in the... there somewhere. <laughs> I hope not. I'm in the front <laughs> row, but please don't search for me. I don't. She's there, I promise you. <laughs> Youth also using broadcast media. Um, doing podcasts, doing uh, appearing on radio shows, appearing on um, Access TV, but using broadcast media to promote public health messages. It's the youth have that authentic, engaging, um, real voice that oftentimes people will listen to and respond to more than they will listen to and respond to a prevention professional doing it because it's my job. And I want to get to our social media piece, right, Rebecca? Because that's something that we talk about as well. So we'll just wrap this piece up with direct media advocacy. Anyone working in prevention probably knows or ought to know that media advocacy is one of our strongest tools. It's not just publicity. It's not just getting your name out there. It's getting your name attached to a policy goal. Um, youth using visual media, print media, and especially social media can be not just participants in this, but really the drivers in this. I'm actually gonna go right to um, informants and specialists, I think, because I wanna make sure we talk about our um, social media component. So I'll take us through a couple of pieces of informants. Then I think Rebecca has a little set of questions for us. Isn't that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So test marketing and focus group. Now we wanna remember that youth being a focus group is not merely me as an adult gathering a bunch of youth together and saying, what do you think we need to do? A focus group is we've all come up with something together, including young people. We think this is going to match the data to, to do the initiative and the outcome we want. Now we take that to a group of youth that were not involved in planning it and say, does this speak to you? I want to really emphasize that. I know I'm being a little fist poundy with it, but I want to emphasize that because focus groups are not just what do you think generally. They are what do you think of this particular initiative that we developed based on data? Does it speak to you? And um, youth won't hold back. Youth won't hold back generally. You give people permission to speak their minds and they will. Outreach materials are a lot more effective if they're for young people when they're made in conjunction with young people. 
So talk a little about something else. Yeah. Absolutely. Just to kind of wrap up um, how to reach out and connect, especially in these pandemic times when we are all physically isolated, but we are still all together in spirit. We're just gonna wrap up with a quick poll question about social media. So of the following, which social media platforms do you feel you have the most experience with? We have Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, and TikTok. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So it seems like we have a strong majority here siding with Facebook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I, I can confidently um, agree with that as well. Honestly, Facebook was the only form of social media I had for a while. And it made me feel kind of like my mom just because I would friend all my friends' parents. And it was fun. I like Facebook. But anyways, Instagram looks like to be our runner up. And then we have Snapchat, Twitter, and the four of you that think TikTok is um, what you're most experienced with, I absolutely love that. I spend too much time on TikTok. Um, well, this is really interesting. And I wish we had more time to just really um, answer your questions about if you have any social media um, that you questions that you would want answered. But point being, so because of this new sort of surge in social media and with this new virtual era we've all been living with, um, living in, especially because of the pandemic, we find that the role of social media is now more important than ever. And youth are such an integral part of this just because of how um, prominent they are on social media and how much they are on social media and this sort of knowledge that they have of each different platform. Thanks. And now something I know where we're in our last couple of minutes here. So what we um, would, would love to be able to do is give you an extensive preview of part two of this youth engagement webinar series, where we talk more specifically about the roles of young people, and we talk about what roles adults can play. In the spirit of youth engagement, though, what we've done with you today, and I'm perfectly happy with this, is we've focused primarily on the roles that young people play. Adults in their supportive roles, that's something we'll talk a lot more about in part two, because that happens once you've developed youth coalition. But the overarching thing I'll say for just a moment about this is adults guide, adults co-participate, adults co-decide, adults co-set the priorities. It's all that collaborative, transparent, um, uh, integrated decision making. Um, and what we want to talk about next time, so think about this. If you're going to be joining us next time, do a little homework for yourselves and think about as an adult collaborator, those of us that, that, that are adults, not young people ourselves, what kind of qualities in ourselves need to be brought to bear to do this? We have some, some answers for you, but I want to put that to you so that when we do part two and we really dig into courageous, authentic, flexible, then we see what kind of roles, especially the um, adults can play and what kind of tools we need to have in our toolbox to be that ideal adult collaborator. I want to make sure that I respect folks time. So on the last piece of adult collaborator, I want to just emphasize flexibility, more important than expertise. Many people would rather have a flexible, relatable, authentic person who still needs to work on learning the data than someone who's wonky in data and can't relate to youth. We want to build bridges, not walls and barriers. So the do's and don'ts, I see actually, if I'm looking at our time, that we are out of time. And I want to make sure that we actually honor that. So what I'm going to do is remind you that our next part two, again, is a lot more about the do's and the don'ts, making sure that we are engaged, we are authentic, we're involving youth, we're not building barriers, we're not sticking to rigidly um, created systems from the past, but creating new ones. And most importantly, that we're not giving Sorry I blew through those, I know I did. I will take full ownership of that, but I wanna draw your attention to the last button point there, do not give up. Something about not giving up would be showing up at CADCA's virtual leadership forum coming up in just a few weeks, starting on February 1st. There are hundreds and hundreds of participants. 
lots of different workshops going on, lots of different um, youth related ones. Rebecca's doing some, I'm doing some with other people. So we wanna thank you. I wanna say on, on behalf of me, all the way here from uh, Oregon, sorry, we had to gloss through the adult part, but I don't mind that. We didn't have to gloss through the youth part and that's great. So I wanna thank you as my parting words and glad you were here. And um, Rebecca, anything parting? I guess sort of my parting words are just um, thank you all just for being so interactive and so engaging, even in this time when we're all physically at home and we're all remote. I had so much fun doing this and getting to spend a little bit of my day with you all and learn more about you. And um, I hope to see you all at part two, hopefully. Thanks, everybody.